Good afternoon. Welcome to the official launch of GEMA Law with the kickoff event, the GEMA Law's first annual Sports and Entertainment Law Symposium. My name is Raquel Del Castillo. I'm the president of GEMA Law. Part of our mission with GEMA Law is to help develop a sports entertainment and media law program here at the Law Center through world-class education, knowledge creation, and the application of the talents of our university's many gifted students. Through GEMA Law, we hope to strengthen the tie between the Law Center and its many, many prominent alumni in the sports, entertainment, and media communities. Before we kick off today's event, I want to say a couple thank yous. First, to our presenting sponsor, Dominique Shelton, Law Class of 1991. To our supporting sponsor, the law firm of Paul Weiss. To all of our panelists, the first panel here today with us, and our second panelists who have helped make an amazing program for you guys today. I'd like to thank everybody that helped me plan this event. John Lerner, I'm not sure where he is. Um, Jody Arlington, the director of GEMA DC. Our board, Matt Fisher, Claire McGee, and Dan Navarro. All of our volunteers, especially Justin Sampson, who came in right at the end. And everybody from the Law Center, Georgetown undergrad campus, and the business school who helped promote the event. And lastly, I'd like to thank all of you guys for coming today. Most people, when they think of Georgetown Law, they think of we're really prominent in international law or you know, public interest work. But what people don't realize is that the Chief Operating Officer of Columbia Pictures, the Senior Vice President of Discovery Communications, the Vice President of Madison Square Gardens, and one of the principal owners of the Washington Nationals are only four of the very prominent executives in this industry who all graduated from this law center. So through the launch of GEMA Law, we're hoping to increase the awareness of our Law Center's prominence in the sports, entertainment, and media industry. Now, I'd like to introduce Jody Arlington. She's the director of GEMA DC, and she'll give you a little bit of background of what GEMA is all about. Good afternoon. How many people here actually know what GEMA is? If, has it Okay, great. Most of you. That's fabulous. Uh, the Georgetown Entertainment and Media Alliance was formed in 2002 and has now over 2,000 members uh, pr around the world, but primarily concentrated in New York, Los Angeles, and here in Washington, D.C. And um, we are doing exactly what uh, Raquel just said that GEMA Law is about. We're about elevating Georgetown's uh, presence in these fields and bringing together all of the alumni and students and friends of Georgetown who really want to uh, engage with the media and entertainment and sports communities. So I really do not want to uh, spend any more time between you and this wonderful symposium. I do want to be sure and thank Raquel, who's just done an amazing job uh, pulling together along with her colleagues, Jima Law. Uh, so uh, if you have any interest about Jima, please come and see me afterwards if you'd like to get involved in some way or learn more. Thank you so much. Okay, now to kick off the event, I'm going to introduce our moderator. Professor Richard Brand is an adjunct professor here at the Law Center. He's also a partner in the business department of Errant Fox, where he focuses on sports law, real estate, and corporate transactions, e-commerce, partnerships, and corporate law. To highlight some of his professional experience, Professor Brand's work has involved the representation of professional sports teams, including the Washington Wizards, the New Jersey Nets, the Charlotte Bobcats, the Washington Mystics, and D.C. United in connection with various matters such as executive contracts for players and coaches, license agreements, sponsorships, salary cap and collective bargaining interpretation, and financings. He's also represented the owners of sports entertainment facilities, including the Verizon Center, the Barclays Center, the Bobcats Arena, in connection with naming rights, sponsorship, advertising, promotional agreements, suite and club seat licensing, financing, and related matters. And part of why he's been so busy getting here this week is because he just closed a deal in the naming of the Bobcats Arena to the Time Warner Arena? Is that Time, correct? Time Warner Cable. Time Warner Cable Arena. So please join me in welcoming Professor Richard Brand as our moderator today. Thanks. Um, glad to be here. A um, couple of things that I wanted to start off with. Uh, I've served on panels quite a bit. Usually I'm not a moderator. The reason is because someone told me that the moderator doesn't get to dominate the conversation, uh, and so I've usually steered clear of that. Although when I got the list of who the people were on the panel, I figured, well, I do sports law. 
I don't know that many of these guys, and every one of these people are people that I would want to meet. So I figured this was a perfect opportunity. The only exception is I don't want to meet Marita because Marita is a competitor. So I don't know if any of you watched Saturday Night Live, the Hillary Clinton uh, debate questions where they would ask Hillary the incredibly tough question and then they'd ask Obama the easy one. Glad you're here, Marita. Uh, who were the last five MVPs in, no. Uh, <laughs> I'll do what I can to embarrass her, but I don't think it's going to be too easy, frankly. Um, I thought we'd get started by introducing um, our panelists, although I think probably most of you uh, will recognize them and probably know as much about them as uh, I'm about to tell you. But let's start with Marita, since I've already taken the first shot. Uh, Marita is a partner at Davis Wright and Tremaine LLP. She was a former senior vice president of BET. Marita is experienced in general corporate counseling, contract negotiation, development of business legal and regulatory strategies for media, telecom, and entertainment clients. Uh, before she went to Davis Wright Tremaine, she was a senior vice president of network programming and operations uh, at BET Networks, and she oversaw East and West Coast programming and product operations for the BET Cable Network and BET Jazz, and worked for, with a number of other startup digital feeds. Uh, I'm not going to go through the rest of this stuff because, frankly, I do know, having worked in these things, you read through all that stuff, most of us don't even understand exactly what it is, and that's why Marita is going to be able to tell us what it, exactly what all that stuff means. Second panelist um, uh, is probably pretty upset. I'd say very upset, Don. Um, I'm looking at the colors here. Um, <laughs> Let's see. Anybody with red has free tickets to the cap playoff game. Anyone sold without out. red <laughs> sold out. See, I gave you that plug. Anyone without wearing red um, is deemed to be a Flyers fan and will not be allowed out of the auditorium until somewhere around 11 o'clock. Um, not surprisingly, Don happens to have a little bit of a connection with the uh, Washington Capitals. Don is the Assistant General Manager and Director of Legal Affairs for the Capitals. He's in his third season with the Capitals, serves as the club's Assistant General Manager and Director of Legal Affairs. He assists the team president and general manager George McPhee on matters such as player contract negotiations, player contract research and analysis, salary arbitration, NHL, team salary cap analysis, and interpretation of NHL, the NHL collective bargaining agreement issues. Uh, Don also assists the general manager with day-to-day -day operations at Capitals Hockey. Um, and in addition, he serves as legal counsel for the Capitals organization generally and the Washington Mystics uh, WNBA Basketball Club. And once again, I have a bone to pick with Don because before Don got there, I was doing a lot of the player contracts for the Washington Mystics. And when Don came and they realized that, number one, they wouldn't have to do it by the hour, and number two, he could do a better job, I'm now a <laughs> special counsel to the Washington Mystics. Uh, and the special thing is I'm not really doing very much for him. But uh, at, the, at the end of this conversation, Don's going to tell me he wants to give me back all the collective bargaining issues and all that other stuff. When we have to do a 13-year Mystics contract, I'll get you on board. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Um, and coincidentally, we may even be talking about that in a few minutes. Um, the next panelist, um, again, uh, I think you've all know of and heard of Stan Kasten, president of Washington Nationals. Um, Stan is can't stay too late today because you're going to the Caps game today, Stan? Oh, no, 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 no. What? Easy. Got it wrong. If I could get tickets, but I understand they're sold out. <laughs> <laughs> what are you wearing? Yeah, they're yeah. sold out. See that? Um, See that? It's uh, better weather. I'll have to well, find well. something else to do tonight. Funny, That's Jimmy just got good tickets because of the tie. Um, well, my, my mentor is Ted Leonsis, so I have to wear a tie. I even bought a jersey yesterday, so I'll put that on over the shirt. But anyway, I, I think Stan can be excused from the Capitals playoff game today. There is another game going on at 730, um, and I think probably... 705, good seats still available. Good seats still available. <laughs> <laughs> What's that number? What's that phone number? Well, um, 675 Nats, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, um, Stan is the, he's a, he's the president of Washington Nationals. Prior to becoming the, the Nationals president, he was in Atlanta, in a long-term fixture in Atlanta professional sports. Um, he started in 1979 when, at 27, he became the youngest general manager in the NBA for the Atlanta Hawks. He held that position until 1990. He became the Hawks president in 1986. Uh, he also became president of the Atlanta Braves in 1986. In 1999, um, uh, when the National Hockey League uh, 
became was was awarded awarded the city of Atlanta with an expansion team. Stan became the president of the Thrashers as well as the chairman of the newly built Phillips Arena. Uh, I did not work on the namings, right? So he's on my list also. I apparently don't like anybody here because I haven't been working with them. Uh, Stan hold, held all these positions until 2003. He graduated from Columbia University Law School and received his undergraduate degree from Rutgers University. Um, the next panelist is Jimmy Lin. Jimmy Lin is Vice President of AOL Sports Diversity Partnerships and Strategic Relationships. Uh, Jimmy has been with AOL uh, 13 years, you told me, yeah. Jimmy? Yeah. 13 years. Um, he was responsible for developing and managing the sports content relationship for AOL. Previously, he was the advertising manager for Home Team Sports. Um, that, which was the CBS-owned regional sports network um, serving the Mid-Atlantic region, um, and, he was, the promo and uh, he was a member of the Time Warner Sports Forum. That's not Time Warner Cable Sports Forum, Time Warner Sports Forum, which includes executives from Sports Illustrated, HBO Sports, TNT Sports, AOL Sports, Time Warner Cable, Time for Media, and Warner's Brothers Licensing. Um, last but not least, because I don't have any bones to pick with Lisa, so perhaps I should have done you <laughs> so first. very special. You're very special. Um, Lisa is the Senior Vice President, Business Affairs and Programming Legal for Discovery Communications. Um, Lisa, um, at Discovery, Lisa negotiates and drafts television programming deals, and she oversees the legal production matters for many of Discovery's networks, including Planet Green, Animal Planet, and Investigation Discovery. Lisa is also responsible for the management of a group of business affairs and legal executives and paralegal. In addition to deal negotiations, her practice area includes advising clients on legal issues related to content liability, with a particular focus on matters related to copyright, defamation, publicity, and privacy rights. Lisa has been with Discovery since uh, March of 1997. Prior to Discovery, she was an associate at the Washington, D.C. law firm Robertson Eckerd, which is now Davis Wright Tremaine, where her practice included communications and entertainment law. Um, I have committed, did you see how well I committed all that to memory? Sorry about the reading, but um, it's a pretty impressive uh, amount of information, and we're, we're all very lucky to have these panelists here. I thought what I would do since, let me ask you a question. How many of you are at the law school? Is this all law students here or a mixture? Okay. Just wanted to make sure. Um, there will be grades given at the end. Um, I thought probably, before we even started going into some specific questions, I thought it might be a good idea for all of you to understand a couple of things. First of all, I'm going to ask each panelist how they got to where they got to. And I think I've already read the, the chronological order, but just an idea as to you know, what their career path was and what they think were some of the key elements to get to doing what they're doing. Each one of them has reached a pretty high level, and uh, it'd be interesting, I think, from a law student's perspective to see how they got there. The second question I'm going to ask you all um, is I'm going to ask you if you all use outside counsel and what role, and I, because I think I, I would take a guess that a large proportion of you people out there are probably going to be going to law firms most of which are in New York, but um, uh, I think it would be probably interesting to find out from you how outside counsel plays a role in what you're doing. And Marita, we don't want to hear about that from you. <laughs> but anyway, let's, let's, start, let's start with Lisa. Sure. Um, a little explanation of how you got where. Yeah, well, first I want to say I'm thrilled to be here. Um, I have to admit that I'd much rather be here talking than be, being here as a student studying <laughs> um, law. I went to school here at Georgetown, spent many um, moments and days in this building and for those of you who are students here I think it's a great opportunity to have GEMA. Um, there were classes that I took here and speaking about how, to, how I got to where I am I always knew I had an interest in entertainment law, communications law, television and um, so I took advantage of some of the classes that hopefully are still around, copyright being a key one if you're talking about preparing yourself at the law school level, copyright, administrative law, corporations. Um, I also did the uh, clinic, the, and uh, that was a terrific experience. I think one of the best things I could have done because it gave me on the ground um, experience as if I were working in the field while I was in um, law school. But I, what I did and what I think I would say very quickly to any of you who have an opportunity is as a law student, as hard as it seems to add things to your schedule, as much as you can get involved in some of the local organizations that give you exposure and experience with um, entertainment or sports or transactional work, 
um, internships. One of my first internships was an unpaid one, not very nice, but key to the beginning of my career at the FCC. Um, I was uh, had an opportunity to meet people like Marita when I was a junior lawyer and worked at a law firm. And this is, I think, one of the key things as you're looking at summer associate positions and, and your third years who are looking for jobs, trying to place yourself. Um, of course, you want a job. That's the first thing we want is a job, but targeting yourself to companies that do the work that you're interested in and looking at um, the firms that have clients that you might want to work for later. So I started at a law firm doing communications law um, and some entertainment law and got a call from a headhunter, which is um, an unusual thing, and left the law firm after a few years and went to Discovery um, and have been you know, doing my practice there for a while. Thank you. And by the way, Aaron Fox and Davis Wright Tremaine are both our um, outside counsel. So you can have two good people on your team. <laughs> Thank you. Um, yeah. See, we, we agreed on that earlier. Um, but uh, you know, in terms of outside counsel, just to answer that quick question, um, you know, I think that actually ties into preparing yourself for school for the after school world too, because we use Errant Fox for a number of matters on trademark litigation. We also use Davis Wright Tremaine on a number of matters for production law, production work and transactional work. And so I think it's important when you're looking at law firms as both a client and a customer and as well as a potential um, employee to look at their reputation, who their clients are, what kind of work they do, and see that they fit in with the culture of how you are. And that's actually very important for us as clients to feel that the, cu the culture of the firm that we're using matches our culture. One last thing I'll say that we don't usually talk a lot about, I didn't hear anything about when I was in law school, and I wish people would tell me, you've got to pay attention to the business side of the world. It's not just about the law. And so you'll learn that in the practical um, sense when you start being a summer associate, but I think that to be an effective lawyer for clients, you've got to think about the business side. Thank you. Um, Jimmy, do you want to tell people how Aaron Fox has helped make your life better, or do you want to just answer? More miserable? <laughs> oh, no. no. Uh, Jimmy, uh, Aaron Fox did a great job. We actually had a uh, five-year partnership with the NFL, with uh, CBS, Viacom, Sportsline, and AOL Time Warner, and you did such a fantastic job doing that 300-page document that I had to manage. Thank you. I mean, well, thank you, because I was actually only kidding, but this is actually terrific. I'm, I'm sure Stan is panicked because he has absolutely no idea. No, no, not true. Aaron Fox is near and dear to me because they bought tickets. So <laughs> what's better than that? Oh, sweet. Yeah. How sweet it is. Even better. So, yes, we okay. greatly value our relationship okay. with Aaron Fox. <laughs> well, I'm sure everybody is really excited to hear about Aaron Fox, but maybe we'll go back, <laughs> back to the topic here. Jimmy, why don't you explain to people how you got where you did? Sure. Thank you. For one, I, I'm not a lawyer. I'm an MBA. I'm a sports guy. I have about 19 years of experience. My background is uh, sports PR, starting out with doing PR for Sugar Ray Leonard and Riddick Bowe. And then I went to radio. I did sports radio, marketing, and promotions. Then I made the segue to TV, where I was at Home Team Sports, which is now Comcast Sportsnet. Uh, it was that, at that point I saw traditional media. If you're trying to move up, you keep hitting the ceiling. And I saw this small interactive uh, news company uh, called America Online back in 94 at a cable conference. And I, and I saw that as a way to differentiate HTS from the other 22 regional sports networks around the country. And I also saw it as a way to just, just make myself different as a, as a marketing person. So I went to the small company called America Online in 94. They were the third online service behind CompuServe and Prodigy. They didn't do deals with regional networks. They didn't have a sports channel. But I got a call in January of 95 and said, hey, we liked you. Would you consider coming on board? I was like, why should I leave TV? Orioles, Bullets, Wizards, uh, Capitals, ACC. But, you know, something in my gut... Um, you know, you really trust your gut. And, and the way I looked at it, in my mind, I, I thought I could become a multimedia sports marketer with a background in PR, radio, TV, and this new, this new medium called online, not knowing what it really was about because the whole World Wide Web wasn't even around then. So I went over to uh, AOL Sports in 95, and uh, we started the sports channel. And it was in my first week there I met a gentleman named Ted Leonsis, who was a... Uh, our president and the guy loved sports but didn't know a whole lot about the sports business and the the thing we shared was our love of Georgetown Hoyas basketball we both were season ticket holders and that's how the friendship started with Ted 
And we just had this fantastic four-year run where we went around the country meeting the top sports people. And I, I, I broker the deal and go with Ted. And we met with you know Mark McCormick, who founded the sports marketing business at IMG, Commissioner Tagliabue, who's, who's a Georgetown grad. Ted and uh, Paul were both on the on the board at Georgetown. We met with David Falk, your, your good friend. Mm -hmm. Or not, um, and you know we, we <laughs> keeps the mouth quiet. So we just went down the line. It was just it was just fantastic, and uh, and then you know Ted en ends up buying the Capitals, uh, but at the, at the same time AOL became uh, used sports and entertainment back in '99 as a way to build our business, and you know AOL at the time was a hot company, um, and we did the merger with Time Warner, and that's what where I met Stan um, back in back in 2000. So I'm also a professor at Georgetown. I teach uh, undergraduates uh, in the business school, sports marketing strategy. I have a couple students here. And I'm always pushing new media and Internet because that's one way for you if you're coming right out of law school or business school that you can differentiate yourself. A lot of execs or partners you go work for don't understand the Internet or new media. So whether it's, it's blogging, it's podcasting, you know, search engine marketing, search, in, search engine optimization, those are the things that you do. So I, I, I'm, for my part of the panel, I'm really going to focus on uh, internet and new media. Thanks, Jim. And, and before I turn this over, humbly speaking, this man is, you, you guys are fortunate to be in this room. No, no, it's true. Mark, he's not that modest, though, right? Yeah. But true, he's the only executive in professional sports history to be the president of three franchises at one time. It's a pretty, pretty remarkable feat, and uh, DC's lucky to have Stan here as the president of the Nationals. And it is a glorious park. Well, before you even start, Stan, I was going to say, uh, I'm a sports lawyer. I'm not exactly sure what sports law is, but I'm a sports lawyer. Lots of us do sports deals, but all we've ever dreamed about doing was doing probably about a third of the things you've done. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And you did it with a law degree. And so I think I want to know, and everyone else here wants to know, how can we get out of doing this law stuff and get into <laughs> doing what you're doing? Well, um, I know you can't do it the way I did because I uh, literally, I was uh, out of law school and I'd taken the bar exam for two states at the same time, which is an awful idea. Um, but I got through that. And I was on my way to go back home to start working for a law firm in New York, an antitrust law firm. But that's what my field was. And uh, I, I met a guy named Ted Turner at a baseball game one night in St. Louis, literally. And we hit it off, and um, he asked me to send him a letter, which I did. And he asked me to come down to Atlanta, which I did. And uh, this was back in 1976. There was no such thing as sports law in 1976. We didn't have in-house lawyers then. It was just at the dawn of the age of agents. There were, you know, even they weren't that prominent then. We didn't have salary caps and things like that in sports at that time. Uh, uh, but, but Ted thought there would be uh, a role for me going forward because the game was, was starting to become more complex. It was starting to enter uh, the era of superstations and all the, the, the burgeoning media applications that, that we have seen over the last three decades. And, uh, and so he, he asked me to uh, first to do some stuff for the Braves. Shortly thereafter, we bought the Hawks. And uh, I was doing some legal things, some in-house in legal things for the Hawks. And um, the Hawks were not doing very well. And uh, he came back from the America's Cup and uh, was upset with everything. So he fired the front office and... Uh, and hired a buddy of his, or asked a buddy of his to just look out for the Hawks, who was retired, and so he didn't want to do any work. <laughs> so the guy said, look, I'll take over, but I need someone to do the work, and I hear you have this young lawyer over at the Braves, and that was me. And so we were going to be there for two weeks and find a, a GM and a president, and, you know, I spent the next 27 years there. I just, just never left. That's just how that happened. Um, and so things were going okay there. We, we started winning quite a bit at the Hawks, and I was getting some personal awards, and the Braves weren't doing very well, and so uh, yeah, about eight years later, Ted comes to me and says, Stan, I need you to take over the Braves, not instead of, but in addition to, which is ludicrous on its face, like so many of Ted's ideas, but you know, that, you know, uh, it just worked out, that's, so that's how I took over the Braves. And uh, then a few more years passed, and we need to build a stadium, which we did. And then we need to build an arena, and no one else in the company knew how to do that, so that was me. And, and then literally, but I was not going to run the hockey team. That We understood that. Even though the commissioner of the NHL is one of my closest friends, I, I just hated hockey and so, and back then. And so, and so I, was, I, I made them promise that we'll build this arena, but I'm not going to run the hockey team. And then we opened the arena. 
We have this expansion franchise. One week into the birth of this expansion franchise, the president of the hockey team quits, and he goes to run the Yes Network in New York. So my phone on my desk rings, ring, ring. Hey, Stan, you've got a third team. That's, that's, that's how that happened. It was not a grand plan. It is not a good idea, I would tell everyone today, but, but that's how it happened. And we had great front offices, all three places, which is why things uh, kind of fell into place. But what I... What I do take away from all of that, what I do tell uh, uh, young lawyers everywhere, it, the most important thing, and I agree with, with uh, what has been said before, if I had it to do over again for my job, I probably would benefit more from an MBA than from a law degree. I'm happy I have my degree, I'm, I'm proud of being a lawyer, but in what I do every day, an MBA would probably be even even more valuable. Uh, but most importantly, whether you choose to become an MBA or an accountant or a lawyer or whatnot, I would spend those first couple of years making sure you're the best MBA accountant lawyer you can be. It doesn't have to be in sports, even if you want to wind up in sports. Be the very best at it that you can be, because otherwise, when you're confronted with an opportunity, you won't be able to capitalize on it. You won't be able to do your best at it unless you've perfected your skills first. So whatever it is you choose, you don't need to have that dream job that first day out of school. Get good at what you're trying to become so that when you have the opportunity there, you can make the most of it. And thank you. I think that's a terrific point. And, and I, before we even go uh, go to Don, uh, I'm sorry, to, um, to yeah, to Don. I've got my list wrong. I want to say one thing about sports law because this is something that uh, I get tremendous numbers of emails. How can I become a sports lawyer? And I'm, I'm just like Ted Leontes. I respond to every email. I say, I don't know um, because I don't know. First of all, I don't know what sports law is. Uh, sports law is what we call ourselves because it sounds a lot better than saying I'm an employment labor lawyer, I'm a litigation lawyer, I do real estate, I do this, I do that. But frankly, sports law is something that you know people say is sports law, with the exception perhaps of the contracts I'll do or collective bargaining agreement or something like that. The rest of it is law. And so if there's any example that I would give to, to young students is get good at what you do. Learn how to write, learn how to read. Uh, as a lawyer, learn how to think as a lawyer, learn how to use whatever those tools are, because sports law is such an amalgamation of things that once you get to be a sports lawyer, that's terrific. But the fact is, everything I do as a sports lawyer is part of everything I've done for the last 24 years, not as a sports lawyer. And please don't say you want to be a sports agent. Yeah. Otherwise, don't, you'll don't make that mistake. That would be. You'll good. hear Stan for the next 45 minutes. <laughs> Don, Don, how about you? How did you get to where you are? Well, I think it's it's good you have this panel because you're getting a good diversity of opinions on how people got to their careers. I my life and my career has sort of come full circle. I I grew up here in Washington. I still live in the city, and I I grew up as a big sports fan. I still am. I grew up as a big Capitals fan, big Redskins fan. Unfortunately. Our baseball team left here just as I was growing up, so I'm sort of the lost generation of baseball fans. I never never really got to root for the Senators like my dad did, and um, now I have to get to learn to love the baseball team. So I grew up as a big sports fan, but I never – I did some sports in college and law school, but never really – it wasn't my dream to become a sports lawyer. It was my dream to become a, a really good lawyer, and that's what I tried to do after law school. I, I went to UCLA for law school, uh, came back east to start my career – Worked in D.C. and Los Angeles for about 10 years as, as a corporate and communications lawyer. Um, I worked for the city of D.C. for four years, worked for a couple agencies as a, as a general counsel. Um, and then sort of like Stan's story, uh, the general manager of the team, um, after the lockout, asked me to come on board, interview with him, and uh, he thought he needed a lawyer to work with the new salary cap and help with contract negotiations and understand the CBA and um, – Kind of like Stan's story, I thought I was just doing the contract stuff, and then once I got there, I was sort of doing – I was the only non-hockey guy in the hockey group. So I, I sort of did everything but, but make the, the judgments, and that's, that's sort of what I still do. We have a whole scouting staff and a general manager that are hockey people, and they decide the players to put on the ice. But, but there's a ton of other law-related work within the organization, much like other sports organizations. There's contract negotiations. There's roster issues. There's uh, – drafting issues, there's restricted free agency, unrestricted free agency, there's budgets, there's internal budget, external budget. So um, even though you might not be doing uh, you might not be doing what you think of as law, you will be using your law degree if you, if you want to do something uh, in the sports field. So that's how I got to where I am. I love what I'm doing. Um, 
it's a blast. Our team opens up the NHL playoffs tonight. Um, we, we've, it's nice to work for an organization that sounds like it's similar than the Nationals in that we, we sort of have a plan. It's not a one-year plan. It's a, it's a long-range plan to build a winner. And it's fun to get to be a part of that, and we hope that we're, we hope that we're in the middle of that process right now. Um, our team's finally in the playoffs after three long years of, of building up. Your, your question on using outside counsel, I can talk about that a little bit because it kind of goes to what I do. Um, when, you, when you go into an organization as in-house counsel, part of your job is to save money. You're, the reason they're paying your salary is so they don't have to pay outside counsel. So um, right, that's enough. Um, thank you. <laughs> I appreciate that. Thank so that's you. a lot of what I do is doing that legal work. But um, also part, and this is a good thing to know as lawyers. Uh, one of the biggest things I think lawyers do better than than doctors, and and uh, is as a lawyer, it's key to know what you don't know, um, and it's key to know when your boss comes to you and asks you a question to say, you know what, I I don't know that, but I know where to look to for the answer. And um, I think our profession's really good at that. And I, I'd like to think I'm good at that, too. And I'll tell you what I don't know, and this is where I've used outside counsel. Um, we've had a couple really high-profile litigation cases um, involving two players that are on our team now, Alexander Ovechkin and Alexander Semen. Um, and these were big-time, high-stakes litigation. And uh, I'm not a litigator, and we hired a, a firm to help us on those cases. Um, that's one way. Um, the other two are much smaller. I use... Um, outside counsel based in Toronto in the arbitration process. In hockey, it's a quasi-litigation process over the summer. Um, and I use outside counsel to help me on the brief writing in, the, in those cases. Um, and then I do use Aaron Fox for um, workers' compensation cases. Payments in the mail, thank you. Um, <laughs> I hope that wasn't too long. Th thanks, Don. Now, Marita, you do get to answer this question because you did something. I've been practicing at Aaron Fox. It's, it's almost embarrassing for 24 years right out of law school. Um, it's either because I really like where I am or I'm completely unemployable. I've never <laughs> been able to figure out which one it is. Now, Marita, you went out, you went inside and you came back out. And I think that, to me, is the most interesting thing, because what I'm usually told by the people right after they come to the door tell me that they're leaving the firm and they're going here or they're going there or going to a client is that they're tired of timesheets, they're tired of billing, they're tired of client development. They want to enter into the wonderful world of client, and that's where they want to stay forever. And in candor, more often than not, that is where they stay. So I'd be real curious, as in addition to how you got there, what made you come back? To the dark side. Oh, okay. And that is particularly interesting cause, because I was one of those people who always said, I don't want to be a lawyer. I came to Washington as an intern, an unpaid internship. I think that's going to be a theme um, in this uh, business. Um, uh, an unpaid internship with a magazine. I wanted to be a writer, and I had no interest in being uh, an attorney at all. And I, but because I had an unpaid internship, I slept on the sofa of um, a Georgetown law student for a semester, and by the time she and one of her other friends, Leon, I see Leon Peace coming in here, all these um, law students ganged up on me and said, you don't want to be a writer, you want to be a lawyer. And I went through this whole thing about how I didn't want to be a lawyer, and they convinced me to at least um, uh, take the LSAT and go through that process. Anyway, um, I ended up going and uh, back home and you know working for a newspaper, but um, I did learn a lot of things about the law when I was with these law students, and one of it, one of the things was that um, you could still, you know, do the writing and do all that, and be in the business that's now communications and entertainment law. Um, back in the day, which I won't say how long ago it was, but I was at George. I graduated from Georgetown in '81, so it was a little while ago. There really wasn't anything called entertainment law, and as Richard said. We, call, we don't, you know, you say entertainment law or sports law, that's how uh, it's easier for people to define us, but that's not really um, how we look at ourselves. We look at ourselves as um, problem solvers. And um, anyway, I, I ended up going through the, the process of matriculating to Georgetown. While I was at Georgetown, I did internships at National Association of Broadcasters. A trade, uh, Washington is a place where it's just, you know, there's just all kinds of trade associations here. I would definitely pursue that because there's a lot more trade associations for the sports and entertainment industries than there are probably um, entertainment organizations in D.C. Um, and then I went from there to be an intern at um, National Cable Television Association. And but but by then I had figured out this unpaid internship was not 
a good thing. So I was able to negotiate pay for myself for those two internships. Uh, after that, I went back from Detroit. I went back to Detroit and practiced um, with a big firm there. And but I still had this desire to get into communication. So I came back and worked for a firm called Cole Raywood and Braverman, which is a boutique firm or was a boutique firm in the cable television industry. And I was at Cole Raywood for 10 years. And during that time, a lot of the people that I encountered um, in the um, business became people who were friends and people I socialized with, um, one of which was Deborah Lee, who's now president of BET. Then she was general counsel. And we just, you know, socializing, had conversations about what's, you know, going on. And I started uh, basically giving her a lot of free advice. So watch it, Richard. <laughs> um, I gave her a lot of free advice about at the time they were trying to get BET distributed in Canada and internationally, and this was something that I did um, for a couple of other uh, companies. So Deborah and I developed a friendship, and when uh, things occurred at BET, the company went public. They were really diversifying into a lot of areas. Uh, Deborah had become a publisher of two magazines. She was wearing the general counsel hat. She was publisher of a couple of magazines and doing a lot of other multitasking, which you often have a time, uh, an opportunity to do in smaller companies um, like that. She asked me if I would, um, BT was a client, by the way. Um, uh, she asked if I would come in and basically take over uh, while she pursued um, business opportunities. So I came in. Uh, senior Vice President of Legal. Um, it was great. Uh, one thing about the difference between outside counsel and being in-house is that in-house, you people don't, you know, you're not charging by the hour, so you tend to have a lot of people coming to you asking you questions, whereas um, when you're outside, um, you know, and you're on the meter, you know, people tend to um, be a lot more um, choosy about what kind of problems they bring you. So um, I had two years as senior vice president of legal. However, I'm not sure if this was for punishment or what, but um, uh, two years into that, I was asked to become senior vice president of production um, and programming. It had been a position that BET had been trying to fill for a number of years. I was a little suspicious because I said, well, why is it that no one will take that job? <laughs> Um, but um, being one thing that I really liked about my legal training is that I don't really consider myself so much of a lawyer as I consider myself to be a problem solver. I think that the skills that you're learning in law um, suit you for whatever it is that you want to do. And as it turned out, the legal skills were really good um, skills to, uh, to utilize in working in-house at a television network that had a lot of employees because I had the labor background, um, in, uh, engineering department. I had supervised seven vice presidents who ranged from, um, you know, a, a lawyer, an engineer, um, three producers, um, uh, and let's see, oh, finance, uh, chief financial officer. And it was, the legal training was invaluable because as a legal officer for a company, you, your clients are all the various departments in the company, and you get to learn a lot about how the company operates. So um, that worked out really well. I had a great time doing four years. I didn't get much sleep um, for four years, and it sort of dispelled the myth that lawyers have that what we do is so, um, you know, grueling because I don't think that as a lawyer I've ever worked as hard as I worked when I was um, in charge of production operations <laughs> at BET. But um, it was a very rewarding thing. Um, but when the company went through um, a uh, buyback, I decided that that was a good time for me to take some time off. You know, I'm, I've been doing this for a long, long time. I took some time off. And then when I thought about what I wanted to do again, I decided I wanted more flexibility in my life. I really liked um, being involved in production. I invested in a couple of um, independent films that are targeted African Americans that I thought uh, showed the kinds of images of African American people that I wanted to be involved in. And I started doing, I was talking to um, Paul DeVoe here, you know, lawyers are writers, and, you know, we were both talking about our screenplays that we're, we've always got in the back pocket. So the, going back to the law firm was kind of a thing for me to do. Richard was asking, how could you do that? Um, it's, it's something that I can do that I enjoy, and that's, I won't say easy, but 
it's, it enables me to pursue some of the other things in my life that I, uh, that I enjoy doing, such as, you know, the um, investing and the uh, writing. And I have the greatest clients, at least a lot of the people who worked um, either with me or were mentors, now they're clients, so I work for them. And so I, have, I feel like I have the best uh, clients imaginable so, imaginable. so I feel like I have the best of all worlds being, you know, outside um, counsel. I will say that having been in-house, um, and Lisa can, will t- speak more to this, you look at things very differently. You tend to solve problems uh, with more of a business um, eye than a legal eye, and uh, I enjoy that a lot better as well. So um, that's basically how I got to where I got. And as for using outside counsel, um, I know Richard said it. Yeah, you need you know. to get one Aaron Fox deal in this conversation, and it's not going to be so easy. But give yeah, it a shot. well, well, Aaron Fox is, has some very nice people over there that I really I hadn't had the pleasure of meeting Richard, but I know some other really nice people cost, there. Do you have any idea how much money I've had to pay the panelists for this? <laughs> well, you didn't pay me enough, <laughs> but. Um, well, I meant but it. one of the outside ca- things about outside counsel that I've learned is having been around the industry for a long time, people tend to come to me when they're looking for people. So, you know, or when people are looking for jobs. So I have a lot of mentees who are in-house now. And the only thing I can say is that it does kind of put you out of work because when you have great in-house people, then they don't call you as much um, for outside work. So that's the only downside, I'd say, about um, the outside counsel um, part. But so that's how I got where I am. Oh, great. Well, th- well, thanks for that information. Now I know that staying here wasn't necessarily a big mistake. It's uh, although if I go inside, I guess I could come back outside at some point. You one, can all. There's always work at a law firm. It's sort of like the post office. One thing. One. One, <laughs> one thing Marita said about business development, which or client development, which is something that I have a very very special um, client development technique. Um, and I think you had a little of it, but I think I have more of it. What it is is you make yourself the most horrendous person to work for, but you do a good job, and you make that person want to least stop working with you almost immediately and go to a place out inside because having worked for me, it's pretty clear that there's no possible way you could ever enjoy being in an outside firm. And then you hire me, one, because you think I might do a good job, but more importantly, because you want to pay me back for all of those awful things I did. That's how I got my, uh, one of uh, Jimmy's friends, Steve Schroeder, was worked for me, went to AOL, and he said, look, I don't want to work for you anymore, but I would love to be able telling you things like, I said today, and <laughs> where is that, and I didn't ask for those answers. So it's actually a very funny way, but as you found out, when people leave, if you've had a nice relationship with them, they do come back to you, albeit in a different way. Now, the topic of today is contract negotiations, and I think this was a fabulous way to find out where everybody got, but I want to ask a few questions uh, to the panelists and see if we can give you guys a little bit of a sense of contract negotiations. And I'm going to start with Lisa. Um, Lisa, uh, obviously, you know, Discovery does one or two transactions every minute. Um, And I'd be curious, I think everybody would love to hear, what are the types of battles that you're used to fighting most frequently when you put together your deals? Um, I, just to give a quick overview, the the deals that I work on, um, picking up on what someone said about being a really good lawyer, transactional work, being able to write, putting together deals is a core part of my responsibility. And so the deals I'm doing are what we call production contracts. Um, hiring producers to produce television shows. And oftentimes, the most contentious areas have to do with rights. And um, Jamie mentioned um, the, I'm sorry, Jimmy mentioned the um, digital world, the new media world. And that is a key point of contention right now in content, the content area. And very point well taken that being on top of how to parse out rights how to exploit them is a really big part of what people want to do, even if you're on the side of broadcasting the content or you're on the side of creating the content. So I would say that's one area. A couple other areas that are important are always money. It's always how much money can you pay me, how much money will I get. Um, People right now are um, bringing deals to companies and feel that they are the ones that need to be the ones holding on to that deal from the minute it gets in the door and every single piece of it that goes 
out of the door. So it goes out on TV, but then it goes out on home video, and then it goes out and maybe there are T-shirts, and maybe there's uh, online play. And so money is a big part of what goes along with it goes along with the rights, actually, and gets negotiated often. The other thing is just talking about what sort of legal issues are, I find, not the things that hold up the deal. You're going to have standard boilerplate terms, reps and warranties, indemnities, um, standard terms that you'll fall back on. I find that those are never the ones that kill a deal. It's how much you'll be paying me, how much will I be able to get back, um, when can I actually say this is the deal breaker, and what's in it for each party. And so those are kind of the big three highlights that I would say um, are contentious deal points. Great. Thanks. Uh, Stan, you've been doing this for a few years. Uh, you've probably negotiated a couple of contracts over those years, one or two, 10, 50, 1,000. Um, what's the di what have you seen change over the last 10, 15, 20 years well, um, in, in two respects, I think. First of all, first of all, it's, everything's gotten quite a bit more expensive than it used to be. It was a whole different world. It wasn't wasn't nearly a business like it is today. When I started in sports, the basketball team had half a dozen people in the front office, and today, it would have a hundred people uh, uh, doing all kinds of things to generate revenue. So, just the sheer numbers involved make it much more complex requires a great deal more sophistication a great deal more specialization and the deals are just more complicated taking into account many more things that's on the business side on the player side what we've seen is the the huge uh, growth in the strength of the unions over that 30 year period um, when we started in sports um, when I started in sports there were unions but we we didn't have uh, the numbers running so high that we needed to put calibrators on them, which we finally did over the last decade in the guise of salary caps. And salary caps in at least three of our four major sports, we still don't have one in baseball, but in the other three sports, there are variations on salary caps. And that has changed uh, all of the contract negotiations, because now it's not just simply about how much money you want to pay, but there are ramifications to how much money you want to pay someone, not just insofar as it becomes a comparable for all subsequent contracts, whether through salary arbitration or a standalone negotiation, but more so as to what money or moves you have left to make up the remainder of your team so that mm -hmm. there's that extra level of complexity in every contract you're negotiating. Again, that is for the other three sports. It continues to not be the case in baseball where we still don't have any governors on what you can pay, but, but no sport has been... Uh, impacted by the growth of dollars as much as baseball in the last in the last 15 years the uh, the revenues of the sport have grown by 6 from 1 billion to 6 billion a year and with that have come all 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 kinds of extra levels of complexity yeah i would say the complexity is something that i've noticed in doing the basketball deals in the basketball cba can't tell you how many times i've been in the swimming pool in the summer and one of the neighbors would say God, you wizards, how could you not go out and sign Ben Wallace for $15 million? And I say, well, we couldn't. Well, what do you mean you can't? Because you won't? And I said, no, because we can't. Mm -hmm. and, it's, and when you look at these CBAs, and perhaps not in baseball, but in the other sports, and you realize that there really are limits, and I think you said it exactly, Stan, there's a cost to what you do, because if you sign, we can, base, basketball has a couple of differences in that the, a free agent has an, un, there's no cap on what a free agent can be signed, but typically if you're going to sign X, that may impact signing Y. And I think to the average person in the world, they just don't understand why Stan or, 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 or George McPhee or Ernie Grunfeld don't go out and just get everybody. Well, let me ask you, when, when you told that fan you can't, was that a response accepted as sufficient? I'm just curious. No, he walked I've never the, had that happen. Got it. Yeah. Actually, I, the funniest story is I had my 13-year-old boy who's a big basketball fan, and the guy said, well, tell me why you couldn't get him. And he said, because they had no room. Yeah. And the guy looked at my son and he said, what are you talking about? And he said, they had no room. And at that point, uh, my son lost a friend. But um, no. Don, how, how, on the same point, because I think you've probably seen a few contracts, didn't you guys just do a big contract recently with, what's the name of the guy, uh, you know, first round draft pick, scored a few goals? No, watch him tonight. We did a, we, um, and it, it, it's fun, but it's also scary in sports. You, uh, 
probably the biggest thing with salary caps is uh, you're forced to to make big decisions, and sometimes you're forced to make them earlier than you, you probably would have 10 years ago. Um, and we just signed uh, we just signed a very long contract. It's our only really long-term contract right now with the Capitals with one of our players, uh, Alex Ovechkin. And um, it's a complicated process. The big I was the biggest thing to know about contract negotiations. I feel like for you all is when you read it in the media, um, you, you often think maybe it comes together over a few shouting matches or two weeks and. Mm -hmm. Contract negotiations in sports, I think, are like any big uh, project, even a real estate project. I mean, they take years sometimes. We we started working on this 13-year contract um, a year before it was done. Now, we don't, we don't talk about it in the media a lot, but it's a lot of preparation. You do a lot of research for it, just like you do for a paper in law school. Um, you even put together work product for the negotiations, like you do in law school. Um, and then you, you talk about it with the other side, and sometimes it takes, uh, in my experience, it takes months. Um, to finally come to an agreement, and um, um, the best the best deals are the ones I find where both sides feel like the other side got the better of them, and I think our contract with Alex Ovechkin sort of fits that mold. It, it, sometimes I read that um, how could the Capitals pay this guy this much money? It's the richest contract in sports, and it is, and he's paid more than any other player in the league. Um, and in fact, when we did the deal, he wasn't the best player in the league, but now he's probably going to win the MVP in the league this year, and. Um, you could say he's worth every penny. And then you read now, some people say, well, how could Alex do this deal? It's 13 years, and he's just going to get better and better. And in five or six years, it's going to look like the Caps got the better of the deal. And um, to me, that's a good sign. You, you, you want a deal where both sides feel like they got the better of each party. And I have no idea whether this deal is a good deal or not. I hope it is. Um, the jury will probably be out in five or six years. Um, we'll see how Alex did. We'll see what other players in the league are earning. And um, we'll find out if it's a good deal or not. But um, it was a really – I hope in all your careers you get to work on a project like that that um, is, a, is an important deal for your company, for your team, for your city. It's a, it's a great project to work on. And in our case, it's one that all parts of our company worked on. It's not every one of our deals that, that Ted Leonsis, who's my boss, gets involved in. But obviously for an investment of $124 million, Ted's very involved. And it's a project where I get to work with George and Ted and Dick and uh, – um, it's very important to our owners. This is a pretty sizable investment, so um, it's, it's, we'll see how it works out tonight. And, and it's funny when you mention that, and I, I don't know if Stan had the same reaction. Stan, uh, I spend more time in the basketball area, and Stan uh, does a little bit in baseball here and there. So we hear 113 million sounds a lot, but when you hear nine million dollars a year, my reaction is, okay, nine million dollars a year. Who in the NBA got nine million dollars a year? And then you say, okay. Who in the NBA didn't get nine million dollars a year? And you start thinking of a Donald Foyle getting, uh, you know, seven million dollars. So I think a lot of it also depends on the sports. There's been a few contracts in baseball stand that have exceeded nine million dollars a year uh, from time well, to time. Well, the average this year is four. The average is four. And is that, that right? Half, half of most teams guys are making five hundred or less. So right. And the NBA average is over six because yep. they have something called a mid-level contract. So I guess it's all it's all relative. But um, nobody said MVP while he was talking. Uh, Aren't we supposed to have that MVP chant? Uh, I, I don't think we need to chant. I, think I don't think we need to chant. It's going to happen. Can, I'd like to add one thing that um, Don, Please. in talking about um, his experience, that, again, balances this business side with the legal side, and that is when you're doing these deals, you have to evaluate risk mm -hmm. on many different levels. And it could be on the sports side, which is what's the risk to this investment for our team and what's the payoff? For me, on the TV side, it might be, how much are we going to put forward on what we think is that next big hit? And if it doesn't hit, are we going to go ahead and try this, continue with this genre of new programming for our network? Or maybe we're going to take a little more risk on the types of programming and, and reality programming that have even insurance risk. And so I think that in talking about things that come up in contract negotiations, on the inside, that's something that you end up advising your clients on and, and evaluating for yourself on the legal side as well as the big business side to say, okay, we've got to do the risk analysis and see where we come out on the end. That's an excellent point. Um, Marita, uh, I thought, you know, one of the things that I, I always joke about, media transactions. I think I'm a media lawyer because I did a couple of cop broadcast agreements. I also may be a media lawyer because I've watched TV a lot. Um, but 
I thought maybe you could spend a few seconds talk about, you know, what are we talking about? When you're a media lawyer, when you're doing media deals, I know that's such a broad thing. It's almost like sports lawyer. It mm -hmm. encompasses everything. But if you could give the, everybody a little sense of what we're talking about when we're talking media transactions. Okay. And um, you're right, Richard. It is very broad because it could be – I tend, I consider myself to work more on the media and entertainment side, but Richard works on the sports side, and sports teams have media deals and – um, and media is starting to expand and grow even as technology change um, changes, you know, sort of at um, warp speed. Um, but generally what we're talking about are um, anywhere from television, radio, um, television deals, radio deals, um, cable television and satellite uh, contracts is basically when we say transactions, we're talking about contracts between uh, content providers and distributors. Um, in my practice, I represent a lot of cable television networks such as Discovery and uh, TV One and um, uh, Kid Sprout Network and a number of uh, cable networks that have primarily media transactions being on the side of content where you're acquiring content, um, you have acquisitions agreements, you have license license agreements, um, and also you have um, agreements with the talent. If you're producing, if the network is producing programming itself, it has a lot of agreements with either writers or um, uh, producers. Um, and um, if you're producing at a particular site, you have what you call venue agreements. Um, you know, if they were going to produce a uh, a Supreme Court show here at Georgetown, we'd have a venue agreement with Georgetown. Um, and then on the distribution side, that's the side where the network um, is actually getting from the satellite um, to your home. And that, in that way, you have the network's deals with uh, Comcast, for instance, or with DirecTV or Echostar for distribution of the entire channel to the home. So uh, when we're talking about media, it could be any number of media. Uh, on the wireless side, you're seeing more and more uh, transactions that deal with uh, wireless technology and, you know, PDAs and MP3, MP3 players. And so media is very, very broad. And when I first started practicing in this industry, uh, we were, if you have, oh, one of the things Lisa talked about was risk. One of the other big things in this business is bargaining power. And um, generally the, the party with the most bargaining power dictates the transaction and provides the contract to the other party working off of your forms. But um, things have been changing a lot um, with uh, content becoming so important in the media space. Uh, so um, sometimes you find that the people who have the uh, content that's most desirable actually have a you know uh, adjustment in bargaining power, or if you have a network that isn't one of the top networks, then there are things that you might negotiate uh, differently. But uh, media is a huge area now and and growing. And it's a very very hot area. And in fact, when we interview people, you know, you. law students, what do you want to do? I want to do media law. What is it? I don't know, but it sounds really cool. Um, so it's probably good to know what it is. Jimmy, on the same, sort of along the same lines, uh, you've worked on a few uh, arrangements between television networks and major sports. You know, wh what do you see as the big issues? What, what do you see is changing? What do you see the problems are? Well, the the <clears throat> in dealing with the leagues at at our at our peak at AOL, we had $470 million worth of deals with the leagues with the four major leagues and with NASCAR. And you just see the difference in how the Internet is, is becoming uh, in the contracts with the leagues. And you see what uh, NFL.com has done. You see what NBA.com has done. And, you know, and I know we're short on time. So one of the things I wanted a couple – uh, nuggets I want to leave with the students is just the importance of the change of media consumption. Like, how are you getting your sports right now? And if you ask the panelists, uh, it's a different answer than how you did. I mean, when, you know, if you're a Washingtonian back in the 80s, Mark, right, if you wanted sports scores, you, you'd want call the George Michael Sports Line at 
202-362-4444. And then you watch your cable networks, right? But right now, it's different. You get your, you want your stuff immediately. So whether it's on your cell phone, your PDA, or your internet site, that's how you're getting your sports content. And so the consumption patterns have changed. So the marketers, the programmers, the teams, they have to realize that. You have to fish where the fish are. And the other re key, uh, really key thing is globalization. You see what's happening, and you know the brilliant sports executives, Commissioner Stern, who might be you know the greatest of all time. What he's done, don't hit me. No, he's no. right up there. Yeah. I mean, what he's done. Well, I mean, you know, they call the NBA nothing but attorneys, and it is. Whether it's Commissioner Stern or the Deputy Commissioner Adam Silver, a great guy. They have a bunch of attorneys. But what they did is they got it. They got the importance of globalization and how to make this sport international years ago. So if you look at, at you see what's going on right now with the NBA in China, it's remarkable. You realize in February, for a regular season basketball game between Houston and Milwaukee, 200 million people watched the game. That's twice while I watched the Super Bowl, right? And that just shows that, that, that that's what's happening. So the TV ratings are declining here in the U.S., but globally for the NBA, they're doing great. And you look what Major League Baseball is doing. They get it, right? They opened the regular season in Boston and in Tokyo with the Red Sox and the A's playing. And so that, that's becoming much more and more prevalent. So if I were you, I'm coming out of law school, I'm coming out of uh, business school, I I'd really try to focus on new media as well as just the, the emerging markets, especially in the Internet. It's really in, in, a, in China and India. Jamie, have you seen a big difference in dealing with the leagues since, since you first, since back in the AOL NFL deal to today? Do you find it a very, very different relationship, or is it pretty similar to what it's been for the last five No, years? it's a much different relationship because the, the leagues get the value of how much incremental revenue they can bring in off the Internet. I mean, the, the, the best example of finding new revenue streams is what the NFL did with DirecTV and the Sunday ticket many years ago. Now they're doing that. Now the leagues and the teams are finding so much new incremental revenue streams via the Internet and, and the wireless devices. So th there's definitely a big change, in the, and the deals are, are separate now, the, the TV deals and the Internet deals being separated. Well, I, I thought what we wanted to make sure we have time for the questions, because you all probably can do a better job of asking the questions than I can. So we're going to take a little bit of time now. Anybody out here would like to ask anybody or everybody a particular question? Uh, and I can hopefully get the glare so I can see. And I think we have a microphone out there. Okay. I'll go first since I got here first. Uh, <laughs> Mr. Fishman, I have a question. It was my understanding that the deal with OV was brokered without him having an agent. How does that change the dynamic between the organization and the player as opposed to when they have an agent representing them? It, Thanks. Thanks. That's right. Um, for those of you unfamiliar, so in the contract we negotiated with uh, our star player, Ovechkin, he wasn't represented by an agent. And that's uh, players can do that. Um, I'm not sure if they can do it in all sports. They probably can. Um, hockey, I'd say it's, it's, it's very rare um, that a player goes without an agent. Uh, it changes the dynamics a lot. Um, the player agents, uh, you can say a lot of things about them, but usually they know the marketplace. And uh, so that's the first obstacle is does the player understand the marketplace? In Ovechkin's case, he did. He, he, he's a top player. It wasn't that hard to point to the top 10 players in the league and tell them what they're earning. He knew what they were earning. It's pretty easy to say, here's the guys are. Then you just spend your time arguing about where he fits within that top 10. So um, you get over that obstacle. The, the, the hard part is when you have an agent in the process, like in any lawyer-client relationship, sometimes it's useful because the, the lawyer or the agent sort of gets it to some degree. They, they can say, oh, here's these 10 players. Uh, I agree with you. He's below these three, but he's above these three. And, and you can sort of have a healthy dialogue. But try talking to a player and saying, you're third on this list, or the player's mom sometimes, <laughs> and saying, oh, you're third on this list, and here's why you're fifth. Or, here, or in my case, I'm always saying they're tenth of the ten. So it makes it more difficult because uh, he thinks he's the best, and he should think he's the best. So it, it may, it's an obstacle to some degree. Um, on the other hand, and I don't know if this is your question, a lot of people think that, oh, that must be really hard because you're saying bad things about the player and, and you're having to say it to his face. I don't find that at all. In fact, on every deal we work on, um, I, I'm never bad-mouthing the player. I just, I'm just telling it like it is with the statistics, and I'd be happy, and I, I don't know how you all will lawyer, but I'm happy to have the client sit in on any negotiation I'm working on. I'm, so I'm happy to lay out for the player or the agent where their statistics are. So it, it's always professional um, when you're working with the player, whether he has an agent or not, or at least I try to make it so. So it's not hard to that degree. You're, you're just talking about money. 
Great. Hi, to uh, either of the entertainment lawyers or to uh, Mr. Lin, uh, I was wondering what you thought the effect of independent media uh, sort of pushing in, and particularly new media with regards to independent media companies, what effect that will have on our opportunities as lawyers going on, and if the concept of having massive entertainment firms or having the, um, the outside counsel like you were discussing uh, is going to change as uh, significantly smaller institutions are looking for legal representation. Um, just quickly, I think that it will create some opportunities as long as, as attorneys, your expectations are um, in line with, you know, what some of the newer companies are dealing with. A lot of times you're talking about smaller companies, so you're not going to be making the kind of money that you might make at a law firm. Uh, and you're, but I think that in a lot of ways it can be very rewarding. Um, one of your colleagues here is going to re uh, point to you is um, Paul DeVoe, who uh, started out after he left Georgetown and worked with a small media company and was able to get involved in every aspect of the business. You tend to do as much business as you do law, and you learn a lot about operations. I think it can be very, very rewarding. Um, kind of thing, and it can help you to leverage into a law firm or into a, a major media company. Or if your company is successful, then you'll have been there at an early stage and, um, you know, me, maybe be one of the principals at the table or have more of an opportunity to be a principal than you would be at, at like a Viacom or something. I, I would just add the part about specialization and, and, and specifically IP. Um, especially if you go global, like you have these, these brands here that, that want access to the huge emerging markets in China and India. So right now there are 150 million people, Chinese on the Internet right now. Within a couple of years that's going to be 450 million. It's going to blow away the U.S. And India right now, 1.1 billion people, only 40 million on the Internet. Soon that's going to be a couple hundred million. So that's where the big portals, the big sports companies, that's how they grow their sports. If you look at the amount of traffic coming to NBA.com, now more than half the traffic in NBA.com comes from uh, international traffic. So the more specialized you get there, that, that's a good niche to be in. Good afternoon. You've mentioned uh, the Houston game in China and I think the Bo Sox game in Tokyo. I, it seems like currently we're importing talent into our sports leagues and that a few of the key ones are the gold standard. I'm just curious if you see in the, the horizon if India and China have so many individuals whether we'll see in the next 10 years American players going to those leagues and those being... Are we talking about, are you always talking about going to embassies? Well, um, American players going to foreign leagues, is that what you're, you're asking about? Well, well, first of all, we do have players uh, in all sports already doing that. Uh, um, you know, basketball has been very good in Western Europe for two or three decades now. Um, hockey's been very good in Eastern Europe for two or three decades. Uh, and baseball in uh, the Far East uh, has been has been very good, but it doesn't pay a lot of money. And so the people that go over there are the people that are not quite good enough to play in the major leagues. And I think that's in general where sports are today. I can't think of a recent example. Stan, now, the, 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 one, the one new thing that's happening is MLS. So now there's more MLS uh, players are going over playing the Premier League because the salaries are a lot bigger over it, there. And I would say I would agree with Jimmy. That's the issue for the for the four major sports right now. There's no league that is good enough to pay major league salaries in their analogs in those sports. MLS is different because soccer is just much bigger around the world. And if we have a good American player, I think his goal is to someday play for a European team. But in the four major sports, the problem so far has been that the quality of play and the quality of the compensation just isn't nearly good enough. But we still have players on that next level, below major league level, going to all those countries and have been for decades as their next best alternative. But it, it does impact uh, what you do in all respects. Uh, Sports, like any other uh, industry, is a global medium. And uh, in the two litigation cases I mentioned, they both were just straight contractual cases where we had Russian hockey players who had uh, commitments to some extent abroad, had commitments here, and it was a dispute over, over which, which legal commitments uh, withheld. So it's a global world, and sometimes you have to fight on this global landscape um, to protect your own company or your organization. There was a very good article in the Washington Post today about the Capitals and, and what's happening with four Russian players. So how popular the Capitals are in Russia, right, in Sweden with, with, with Backstrom and in Canada. It's become the hot U.S. team in Canada, or the Capitals. And, and you're seeing that in your website traffic. Yeah, definitely. 
And, of course, Don, in the WNBA, because they don't pay quite as well in WNBA, they play in both leagues. Uh, most of the top players in the WNBA will play in Europe or abroad and then come back for the summer to and play in the it's WNBA. it's similar to the soccer analogy where they earn more abroad. Yeah, they, they make about 70,000, 80,000 max in WNBA. They can make up to 375,000 or 400,000 playing in Russia. And the good news is they can do both in the WNBA, right. which is pretty unusual. And the ironic thing is four of the best players went to play for the Moscow Dynamo, which was run by Alex Ovechkin's mother, mm -hmm. former Olympic basketball. Did we have any more questions? Probably one more, you think? Hi. Um, my question was for Mr. Fishman. Um, every year around the trade deadline, you get a lot of things in the media talking about no trade clauses. Uh -huh. I was just wondering like, how prevalent those are and if it's like a really big issue or not. Yeah, it's a, maybe Stan will talk about this in other sports. It's a huge issue in hockey. Uh, basically, the, the free aid, unrestricted free agency age in hockey keeps getting lowered and lowered. So now it's 27 years old. And uh, when, a, when a player signs a contract as an unrestricted free agent, they're making they – it's a big day for a, for a player because they can choose from among 30 teams. And often they're choosing the team because that's the team they want to play for. That's the city they want to play for. Maybe it's the coach. Maybe it's a Western team or an Eastern team. So oftentimes they'll negotiate, and the league CBA allows them to negotiate as part of the deal what's called a no-trade clause. And uh, that's a pretty – in my mind, it's a pretty – harsh clause because one of the benefits of a contract in the sports industry it's, it's pretty is that you can assign it from team to team you can trade that player um, if the if the player's not working out or maybe budget wise it's not working out or you get a new coach you can always assign the player so for teams to agree to a no trade clause and a lot of teams have been more willing to than, than we have it's a pretty big impediment to your flexibility because uh, now the players in control um, instead of having 29 other teams you can talk to you have zero unless the player okays it. So it's a huge issue, I think, to follow in sports in general because it really shifts the power to the players uh, in terms of allowing the team to trade them instead of uh, to the teams. Uh, in, in hockey, as Don said, yes, you can include it in contracts. In basketball, you can only under very limited circumstances. Otherwise, you cannot have one in a basketball contract. Uh, in baseball, you can, but after you've been a 10-year player, five with the same team, you automatically have, uh, have a no-trade clause. I will tell you, in my career, 30 years now, three teams, I have never yet uh, negotiated a no-trade clause, ever, not once. I don't know that I never will, but so far I haven't. Um, and, what I, and, and I have some pretty big names that I've signed over my career, and I use all of them. You know, Tom Glavin, Greg Maddox, Moses Malone, Danny Heatley never got a no trade even though they were paid a lot of money. And so I'm able to use them as examples that, hey, I didn't give it to any of them. I'm not going to give it to you. If I had given it to them or the first one I do give, I better be prepared for the next 50 because I won't have that to say anymore. Um, but my main argument for never doing that so far in my career is that, look, I'll negotiate money with you. I'll pay you money. We can fight about that, and I can give you whatever I decide is fair, and you can take that. What I can't give you is my ability to improve my team. If the day comes that I have to make move X to make my team better, I don't want to have given that away to you. If I need to move you to make my team better, I just think philosophically that's not something I can ever have negotiated away. That's why it's so important to me to not ever have been given a no-trade clause. And I will add one thing about basketball, actually two things about basketball. First of all, uh, it stands right, it's a very unusual circumstance in basketball where there's a no-trade provision, but the NBA takes sort of a middle position. They have trade kickers. They say, we're not going to tell you you can't trade them, but if you do trade them, you're going to have to pay a trade kicker of 15% of the remaining compensation. So in a deal with a 13-year, uh, for, for, with Alec... Yeah, lump sum. Yeah. yeah. It's a, it's a big amount of money. The second thing I would say, and I think Stan's philosophy is a great one, because just having worked on a number of player contracts, when that first contract is out there in the NBA, if Amare Stoudemire has a trade kicker provision in there, then the next great maximum player contract, no matter who that team is, is going to have that because these players, it's on, you know, on all, at least in basketball, you, you rarely will see one, and again, we're talking about the very top, top of the limit. You know, when Dwayne Wade or LeBron James or hopefully Gilbert Arenas have a contract, they're going to look and see what everybody else got. And it's amazing how it's very difficult, at least in basketball, perhaps. In, you know, Stan, that's an incredible ability to have 
prevented it all those years. But you know, just say no. I I don't I don't get to say yes or no. I get to say what time do you want it? Um, that's a little bit different. I think we have time for one last question. And so very quick, I guess, for uh, Mr. Caston, recognizing that baseball is a little different, um, given the salary escalation that uh, t tends to follow with the other sports, what do you foresee with respect to baseball? Um, what do, you, do you foresee salary escalation like that, and how do you think it might impact the Nationals? Well, it's, uh, you know, salaries have escalated consistently, you know, for at least the last three decades. I don't see that stopping. I think it's always going to fluctuate with the health of the sport. Um, and and right now baseball is is relatively healthy, and and so I would anticipate salaries continuing to go up. We have a very young team, a building team. Those teams tend to be uh, uh, have smaller payrolls. As our young kids grow up and get older, uh, those payrolls are going to increase. That's just an inevitable part of the maturation process. Um, but it is heartening to know that three of the final four teams in baseball last year. Cleveland, Colorado, and Arizona were all teams that were built internally and were all able to compete again in the final four baseball teams on payrolls that were in the bottom quartile. So, you know, you can make a team um, uh, compete at a low number, but uh, you can be assured that as that team stays together, those payrolls are uh, inevitably going to grow. Well, I wanted to thank you all for a terrific job. I think we all learned a lot and enjoyed it quite a bit. And uh, thank you all for, for coming. We're going to take a very quick 10-minute break for anybody that needs to run to the bathroom. There's coffee, some water and sodas outside down here in the lower lobby. And then right at 445, we're going to start the second panel. And thank you very much to all of our panelists for being here. What's that? Is Rebecca from AOL as well? Rebecca Glashow? Uh, I don't know. Sure. Is still electrical? It turns them off. Did I have a name tag? Does it matter? I don't know where they are. You're going to have to look at them. I don't need it. I'll take mine off to make you feel better.